Hello, and welcome to the All Things Narrative podcast, where we explore the relationships between the stories we love and the stories we live. I'm your host, Derek Hatch, and let's get started. All right, so we are back at the top of the month, and we are diving in once again to somebody's story. And boy, do I have an exciting guest for you. I'm really excited because I think I may have found a kindred spirit and uh, a long lost twin of mine in some ways. Thank you so much for tuning in. And before we dive into this conversation, I just want to encourage you to check out allthingsnarrative.com if you want to learn more about how you can be empowered to live a meaningful story. And if you're interested in finding a way to share a piece of your story right here on this podcast, make sure you listen all the way to the end of this episode where I'll give you the details on that. So I met this guy a while back. And his name and our guest today is Mr. Kyle Arrington. And before I tell you about what he's done in his bio, I got to tell you that uh, when I first met him, I learned that he was a drummer, that we were uh, both going to go to the same church, and that he is just as obsessed with stories as me. Maybe even more so because he's made a whole career out of it. And so let me tell you about Mr. Kyle Arrington and the journey that we are going to go on today in learning about the story of becoming a professional writer, writer in Hollywood, screenwriter for television, and beyond. So yeah, here we go. Let's get into this. So our guest today, Kyle Arrington, is a TV and feature writer, having written and produced two features, Dead Dad and Recovery, and numerous episodes for the CW's The Originals over its five-season run. In addition, he also worked on House MD, The Big C, Conan, was the showrunner for Snapchat Save Me, and is currently developing projects for multiple studios and production companies, including a supernatural Vietnam War series for Sony, along with producing partners Franklin Leonard, The Blacklist, and Vertigo Entertainment. And in addition to his writing, Kyle teaches TV writing at the Florida State University Film School's MFA Screenwriting Program and the University of Delaware, and is also a program director for film festivals. But most of all, Kyle enjoys going on adventures with his wife and son, who are friends with my wife and daughters. So let's give it up for Kyle. Welcome to the All Things Narrative Podcast. Thank you. I am very happy to be here. Oh, man. We have been looking forward to this conversation here. I'd say. I'd say we've had a lot of conversations and prepped for this conversation, which is great. (laughs) Yes. So this is going to be a lot of fun because essentially you're living my dream job. You get to write for... The, the small screen mm. and even ambitions for the big screen and you get to teach on yeah. the side. Mm-hmm. And so I want to kind of just dive into this journey Great. and just uh, how this all started. So Kyle, it's no surprise to me that you love stories and mm-hmm. you love storytelling. So what got you into that? Gosh, that's such a good question. Um, I think it's inherent. I remember when I was really young, my my mom would wake up in the middle of the night with me screaming. Mm. Uh, she would come in. I was about three. It was the earliest that this would happen. And I would say, Mommy, I have an idea. Can you please write it down? Oh. So by the time I was uh, basically f- starting to formulate my identity, my mm-hmm. parents knew I was going to be creative in some way, shape, or form. Um, I remember... When I was in kindergarten, we had a kind of uh, group kind of auditorium thing that would happen like every Friday or every other Friday, something like that. And they needed a spot filled at one point. So I pitched to my professor, what if I wrote a play and my friend and I played Garfield and Odie? (laughs) Uh, and, and they were like, if you want to. So I wrote a play when I was in kindergarten. So it's, it's, I don't even know what made me want. It just, it was always in me and I've been doing it ever since. Um, and luckily it's been consistently, uh, fruitful. Wow. So even at a young age, you know, you were 
going in and telling, you said your parents, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, at three years old that you've got an idea, write it down. Yes. Before I could spell or anything. And did they do that? Did they write oh, yeah. it down? <clears throat> My mom, she said she wished she had kept some of them, but uh, they were mostly like, you know, um, the bee is mean or something okay, like that. Sure. But, it, but it would be an idea that I thought was important enough to wake her up and let her know. I'm like, mom, the bee's mean. So stuff like that. But you know, she she would always say that there was emotionality attached to everything I was saying. It wasn't yeah. just like, uh, you know, a frog jumps off a cliff. It would be like the angry frog jumps off the cliff. There would always be some emotional element mm. that she was like, when she was kind of clocking it at an early age. She was yeah. like, oh, there's something happening here with this creative side. Yeah. As a child, were you very emotionally aware of other people? Very much so. Yeah. I'm, I, I, my wife sometimes calls me an empath because I leech off of people's emotional states very easily. Mm. I can sense people's emotional states very easily and I care a lot. So a lot of times I kind of found myself in situations where if somebody was in a not so great emotional place through, you know, elementary school on to college, even to the present, I would kind of step in and try to um, kind of navigate that into a more positive direction because I, I could tell something was happening and I saw an ability to course correct. How did, how did you do that? How'd you navigate Um, you know, I always felt like I could try to meet them where they were, you know, try to empathize with where they were at. Um, for example, one of my closest friends when I was in kindergarten and all the way through, um, high school was a very short, very, very little person. Um, and I very tall person. Yeah. Um, but he would get bullied on a lot. And I I remember, yeah, it's, it's the sad truth. And, you know, and size sadly had a lot to do with it a lot of times, Mm -hmm. especially for boys. Yes. And, um, he got bullied a lot. And the thing is, is that like, I thought he was really cool. He had really cool imagination, Mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of people weren't, uh, seeing that they were instead seeing something that they could feel powerful around. And I remember we had a bully, a schoolyard bully that, um, one day was picking on him. And I literally just stepped up and I said, leave him alone. And I just Mm. threw my first punch. Oh, wow. And I broke the kid's nose. Wow. How old were you? (laughs) I was five. Five. Wow. Maybe six. I was, it was kindergarten. So five or six. Um, Didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Um, And I remember vividly the teacher taking me aside and being like, I have to put you in timeout, but Mm. thank you for standing up for him. Wow. Because it was like they didn't, my teacher didn't want to stifle that. They wanted to stifle the violence, which, you know, was just a child lashing out. But he was a legitimate bully. And I remember um, being really curious about that. Like, so people liked the fact that I was helping this person out who needed it. And I really liked that power. I didn't like the violence. I loved the support. And so then I kind of leaned into that kind of and and storytelling allows me to do that. Yeah, that's just what I was going to ask. When you started to write stories around that time, were the pe- these people, you know, your friend that mm-hmm. got bullied or the bully themselves, were they, were you finding yourself incorporating them into your stories? I wasn't, at that point, or, I wasn't or, yet writing. Or maybe even leaning into those experiences in some way? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think ultimately like the thing that I remember specifically about like that scenario, cause it was pretty, it's pretty crucial for my formation as, as a creative person yeah. was that like, I really empathized with both. I, I knew he had a really tough home life. I mm-hmm. knew that, um, the, the bully did. And, and so I kind of empathized with both. Okay. Um, and it was interesting because that has kind of been prevalent throughout my life and my career is humanizing, mm-hmm. um, especially humanizing villains or the difficult to humanize because it makes it easier to understand why people do what they do. Yeah. And when you can understand why someone does what they do, it's easier for an audience to connect with them. And from a psychological perspective, if that person's a villain, that creates an interesting conflict with mm. the audience member. They're yes. watching someone they understand. They're, I mean, Thanos is an incredible example of this yes. where it's like, his, I'm sorry, his logic is sound. Mm-hmm. Do I support what he's doing? No, but I mean, you understand how he got there. You understand. Yeah. I mean, look at what happened to his home planet. It's right. like, why would, if that were me, would I not have a somewhat similar context? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting. And that's, most stories that I, I started truly, truly writing, writing, like consciously writing for myself in middle school. 
Well, as a writer, you have to have this understanding that, and this is true in narrative practices as well, that people are multi-story, mm-hmm. that the characters that you write in these stories, you know, yeah, you have static characters and dynamic characters, but even a static character, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but even as a writer, you are still probably thinking a lot more about that character than what's presented mm-hmm. on the screen, right? Absolutely. So there's this idea that characters are never just what they see. We mm-hmm. can learn about a character and what's important to them by watching what they do. Yes. But, you know, Thanos is like an example of that, or the bully, Mm -hmm. you know, is an example of understanding people, uh, this multi-storied reality. Yeah, summation of their life experience. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So as you were growing up, I mean, what were some of your favorite stories? I mean, my, I think my first kind of like true obsession when I was a kid was never ending story. Okay. That, yeah. That, um, you're an eighties child then. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I was, I was born in 85. So okay, that was, okay, yeah. that was, I think that a movie actually came out in 85. So I saw it when I was pretty young. You okay. Know, I was probably four or five and it has persistently been one of my favorite uh, movies. Were you movies. terrified at all? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you think of, you think of the nothing. I mean, I also think of that animatronic Fox. Oh wolf. yeah. I mean, it was yeah, yeah, yeah. terrifying as a child. Oh yeah. Um, the, the loss of, um, our tax, the horse, that's such a, a painful memory I remember as a kid, but then oh, also you have the joy of the rock biter and the yeah. racing snail and all those things. Oh yeah. But the thing for me that resonated the most was the story was about a kid who was bullied. Yeah. Found solace in fiction, in in fantasy, and through that learned how to confront the, his realities. Mm. And because it's it's at the end of the movie when falcor comes out of the book and chases the bullies away mm-hmm. and and sebastian is now strong yeah um and it's only through reading a book did he find this power oh. and that had a huge impact on me uh, because i was a res- i read so much when i was a kid yeah um regretfully not nearly as much now but um i remember the first time that i read dune yeah it changed me um mm-hmm. massively and that was middle school so for me, it was a mix of a lot, a lot of fantasy worlds, you know, Star Wars, obviously yeah, huge impact on me, mm-hmm. um, never ending story. But I also will say that there, it was an interesting time growing up in the nineties because, um, Nickelodeon had phenomenal programming for did. kids. See, I was a nineties kid. I was born in 91. Oh, so. Yeah. so, you know, it, I mean, yeah, unbelievably Unbelievable. good programming and, yes. and, and also programming that basically said like, it's cool to be weird. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, like it's okay to, to fantasize. Like I think of adventures of Pete and Pete. Yeah. This is one of the greatest shows for an imaginative child I've yeah. ever experienced because it's about the kind of like doldrums of suburbia told through the lens of fantastical children. Yeah. There's an episode that still to this day I, I recommend to my students and yeah. I recommend to people. It's called The Nightcrawlers. Uh-huh. Um, and it's the story. It's a. It's basically a slasher thriller, but the 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 killer is sleep, and it's okay. it's kids trying to stay awake for as long as they can, and little by little, like piece little, by piece, they start falling asleep. Oh, like a little nightmare on Elm Street. The, yeah, but it, but it's yeah. told like a basically like a slasher thriller, and it, yeah. they each have tactics in which they try to stave off sleep. Like yeah. one of the girls like pulls her pigtails. Um, and the other one stares into the sun, but then it's, it's cloudy. And so she falls asleep and it's fantastic. But wow. I remember as a kid thinking that it was, it was a way of making something weird, meaningful. Yeah. And, and it, it, it was easy to connect with that kind of weirdness. And that it was, it was just super impactful as, as a, a decidedly weird child. Yeah. I, I, I loved watching those Nickelodeon shows yeah. and I always like, I even, with my kids, I'm starting to show my kids. They're probably a little too young for it, but I don't care. Uh, hey Arnold, oh, it's so good because it's just like <laughs> it's so good. I'm like, this is almost better at being an adult. Because oh, it is. Now I can like appreciate all the sophisticated ideas. Mm-hmm. I feel that same but, way about Doug. Like oh Doug yeah, and hey Arnold oh yeah, are way more impactful now. Which it was. They were written by adults, which is yeah. fascinating to imagine. Like the, yeah, of course they, they had, had to find something. Yeah, to they had to. a really good diversity of like very grounded in reality and very like out there crazy creative ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is as a kid is amazing. So I, I I got a sense of different stories Mm -hmm. 
And in the fantasy realm, there's this idea that you're creating a world. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, you know, that's what you're doing as well is you, whether you're adapting a story or making something, you know, new from the ground or you're inspired or spinning off something, whatever it is, you're creating a world and fantasy really shows the endless possibilities Mm -hmm. that are out there. So as you're at, like all of us do consuming these stories, when does it get to the point when you shift from, oh, I like writing stories to this is what I want to spend the rest of my life doing professionally? Mm. Um, it was the first time I ever acted. That was that was really the shift for me. Yeah. Um, my brother, so I, I lucked out that my brother and I were very close. And mm-hmm. when I was a freshman in high school, he was a senior. Okay. So when I arrived into high school, I didn't have any of the growing pains because my brother and I were very close and I was close with all his friends. That's so great. Like my, my welcome into high school was very warm. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully I didn't have any of those um, concerns, but my brother was one of the sound designers for our theater program. Okay. And so he was involved in that. My brother ended up getting a degree, a BFA in, in audio engineering at university of Miami. And he's mm-hmm. an editor now and for okay. film and TV. Okay. So, um, and I, you know, he's a bass player and, and I'm a drummer. So right. we were always, wow, that's weird. That's me and my brother. Uh, is it, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> of see, course it is. Let the similarities I keep know, coming. There it is. The twindom continues. Yep. Um, but, but yeah, it was, so you know exactly what that's like. There's, there's a kind of, there's an unspoken kind of connection. Absolutely. And if my brother was fascinated in something that maybe I didn't understand, I was going to look a little closer. You know, whether that was music or people, or in this case, it was theater. I was not interested in theater at all. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to do theater. Like, but my brother was doing sound design. Mm-hmm. And so I would see the plays and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And there was, I remember very specifically, it was the, we did uh, two plays every year mm-hmm. in my school, my very small high school. And um, the first play of my sophomore year of high school was Lend Me a Tenor. Okay. And I remember thinking, I could do better than this. Not like in an ego way. It, yeah. was, it was it was kind of like a I wouldn't do that. I would have, I would have done this instead. Like it was sure, I was sure. consciously not critiquing them but imagining myself in those shoes. Yeah. And then I mentioned that to the theater director and she was like, "Well, why don't you audition for the next play?" And I was like, "Okay, fine." Uh, and the next play was Romeo and Juliet. <sighs> One of my faves. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, undeniably incredible. Yeah. And obviously this is a few years after the amazing Baz Luhrmann movie had come out, um, which. The one with DiCaprio. One with oh DiCaprio and Harold Pe- Perrineau. And- Listen, people, people dog on that movie sometimes. Oh, that movie uh-uh. is brilliant. Oh, it's so good. It's be- yeah. The, the way. <laughs> can we dedicate uses, an hour to talk? Right. About <laughs> the way it uses symbol and. It's great. The way it can adapt it, yeah, it we can aged, talk about that. It aged up to modern era with an interesting, I just loved, I mean, I people still rag on the long sword moment, but that's what he names his his gun that's in the car. I'm like, who cares? I'm like, fine. People name their guns weirder things sure, than the long sword. Sure, sure. Um, yep. It was great. And and I was entranced with Harold Perrineau's performance of Mercutio. Oh my gosh. So good. Incredible. One of the, so gripping. One of the best, to me, one of the best performances of my childhood movies that came out yeah, in that era. I can see that. Um, and, and for me, massively impactful um, mm-hmm. as an artist. I remember just thinking like, oh. Man, he just he went full tilt. He like disappeared into that so, character. So please tell me you get to play Mercutio. So I auditioned for Mercutio yes. and, I, and I got the oh part. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so you my, channeled that I in did fully. And, wow! And so it was. It was one did, of the first times I noticed a dream coming to fruition through my passion. Wow! And and that was in in everything I thought I could pull off as that character. I. I kind of did like, yeah. I'm not saying I was, I wasn't going to win an Oscar, but like mm-hmm. for my school's theater, it kind of shook things up a little bit. Wow. Cause now I was like, Oh, I like this. And my theater program was losing their leading men. We didn't have mm. any leading men in the junior you younger, year. Yeah. All of the seniors were leaving and all the seniors were in lend me a tenor and <clears throat> now in Romeo and Juliet. And they didn't have anyone. So suddenly I was just like, uh oh, it's me. And I love this. Yeah. And so I just leaned in hard. So it was well theater. received. It was well received. Did you, did you cross dress at all? No, no, none of that. <laughs> but um, but uh, to kind of give you a, um, 
an idea of how much I enjoyed it yeah. after our first performance. So I also played the apothecary. Okay. So yeah, that, after, that, cause you know, the, he's only in that one scene near yeah. the end. Um, and Mercutio, you know, spoiler alert, sorry, <laughs> Mercutio dies. If you, if you don't know this, you don't know this. that is not my problem. <laughs> um, but, um, so Mercutio has gone and they needed somebody to play apothecary. It's a great part too. So yeah. I got to do that as well. I left the stage after my first performance as Mercutio was jumping up and down on the hallways in sheer excitement. And I had a heart palpitation and fainted. <gasps> oh my gosh. <laughs> and when I went back out on stage as the old man apothecary, I was trembling because oh, I, wow. of the actual thing that had happened to me. And people were like, you were so good as the apothecary. And I'm like, I didn't act for a second. <laughs> I was that in, was real. I was in medical duress. Wow, wow. <laughs> um, but it it affected me so viscerally. Yeah, you know that I was just like I mean I was like I gotta check my excitement levels because I love this. So you're getting a taste for performance, and I'm sure that channels into you becoming a storyteller mm-hmm. as well. Because now you're going on the other side and you're seeing what it feels like to be in it, yes. to be in the narrative. And so I take it you go to college and you start focusing on that direction, on screenwriting? Yeah, and- I, I, all of my colleges that I applied to specifically were because of their film programs. So okay. I didn't get into the one I wanted to get into, which was mm-hmm. the Florida State uh, film school, the BFA program. I okay. didn't get in, but I decided to go to FSU anyway to work on their film sets. Sorry, backtrack here. Did you grow up in Florida? Or? No, I sorry, I grew up in Augusta, Georgia. Okay, so I'm, you, you I, grew up- I, I grew up in Georgia, and so going to Florida State was it was a big move for me, right? Even and though we, it was only six hours. And we both lived in California for periods of time yes. in our lives, which mm-hmm. is another thing we have in yeah, common. Exactly. And now we're both here in Florida. I know the twindom continues. So, but it's it's interesting because Georgia now is like a big hub for yes. film, but it wasn't back then, Not right? Not at all. No, I mean, I remember specifically there's uh, the Janine Garofalo movie, The Truth of about cats and dogs mm-hmm. filmed for like one day in Augusta. And that was a big deal wow. in my hometown. But like there wasn't a lot filming uh, in, in anywhere in Georgia yeah. at that point in the 80s, 90s. You had like aughts. Forrest Gump and Savannah. But, yep. Yep. but now but, you go to drive through Atlanta and everything. Is I a, mean, they film you know. more movies in Atlanta than they do in California. Wow. Um, and I think that shift happened a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and because of the tax credit yeah. and we can get in, but that's where the show that I wrote for filmed, we filmed in Conyers, Georgia. So okay. I would, it was funny to leave Georgia to move to LA to write a show that filmed in Georgia, two hours away from my hometown. <laughs> wow. You know, let's talk about that now. Let's talk yeah. about the industry itself. Sure. So what were some things that you created that helped you? Cause I, I'm assuming, you know, you're in college and mm-hmm. you're, you're making things, mm-hmm. but what was what were some of the things that people, you know, at the top started to notice and say, hey, we need to get this guy in here? Um, that's a good question. I, I think it's kind of a, it's multi-tier because a lot of it was me building up the confidence to do what I ended up doing. And, and my first example of that was my I, I did a five minute short film in film school um, that I loved and was well received. And it was a. It was out of the box genre wise for me. It was a dark comedy. It was like very similar to like Clue. Okay. But I ended up nailing it tonally, or at least um, from, from from me. And, yeah. um, and I was like, wow, that's exactly what I wanted it to be. So I got confidence to be like, I know I can do these things. Yeah. So when I um, got the opportunity to make a feature film, which was very organically born. I made one with some friends uh, Mm -hmm. from film school in 2011. We wrote, produced, um, and I acted in a feature film. That was my way of saying, um, this is what I can do. Yeah. What was that film called? This is called Dead Dad. Oh my gosh. I, I've been waiting to talk about Dead Dad <laughs> because before we before you got here, I went and watched a trailer for Dead Dad <laughs> and I, I watched like five internet. seconds of it and I stopped and I, I said, Tor, I said, Tori, you have to see this. I'm like, just watch this right now. And she's like, it's Kyle. Uh, I'm like, yeah, there he is right there. He's in yeah, Dead Dad. A much younger and, version. And oh my gosh, we laughed. It's really funny. Oh, like wow. just the trailer alone, I was like, oh, I want to see this movie. Oh, wow. Thanks. So I don't know where you can watch it, but. Sadly, it uh, as of 
I think literally six months ago, it, it, you can no longer purchase it from Amazon. Um, but we we had a very healthy run yeah. on um, Film Buff, which then became, I forget the name of the company that bought them okay. for a short period of time. But it was available to buy on streaming on Amazon and yeah. on Vudu and uh, stuff like that. But then the streaming disappeared and you could buy the DVD on Amazon. But okay. Amazon is no longer doing that. Gotcha. So literally the only way you can see it is on the DVD that I own or I have it on like my Google Drive. And wow. so do the, you know, director and editor and stuff well, like that. Well, I would love to see it at some point if you my were pleasure. up for it because it looked hilarious and I was it, it totally is a lot of my I, I, I can have some twisted humor sometimes. Uh-huh. And there were a couple of jokes in there that I was just like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I would have fun with this. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. yeah, so that's great. So you made this movie yes. and it looks really good. Yeah, we did. Like, we did. It I'm looks really, really proud of legitimate. Movie. The acting, like everything, you could throw that up and I could have mistaken it as being like a big like a larger studio production, oh, you know? Cool. Yeah. So you had a great team that put that together. We did, yeah. Was the, we, the, the budget for that movie was only $25,000. Wow. Which is uh, non-existent. Wow. That, uh, micro budget doesn't touch that number. Every one of the main crew members did it for free. Wow. Um, all three of the actors, me, I, so the, the movie is about three estranged siblings that come together to scatter their father's ashes, uh, mm-hmm. but they don't agree on how to do it. Okay. And all three of the siblings, me being one of them, I play the middle child, Russell. Yeah. Um, all three of us did it for free. Me, number one, because I had written it, was producing it and, right. uh, was acting. I was like, I'm, if I'm going to ask anybody to do this movie, it, I'm going to do it for free. Yeah. Um, and then. The other actors were trying to make a name for themselves, trying to get good reels, and right, they right. were friends. So okay. it, it basically was a bunch of friends that worked five weekends in a row to make a movie for free. We, the wow. only people we paid were our day player actors, and they okay. they got a hundred dollars a day at SAG, um, like micro budget okay. wages. Yeah. So between that and locations and permits and equipment, it only cost twenty five thousand dollars. Okay, and that was so that was around 2011, 2012. Yeah. And that was a passion project. Passion, yes. Now, you made that film. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Did somebody see it? Did you gain confidence? Yes. um, Uh, The latter. Um, So it did. We had a healthy festival run. A lot of people saw it, but nothing happened. Okay, I, I did see that it did win some awards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we so we did 26 film festivals from 2012 to 2013. Um, some pretty pres- prestigious ones that we're still really proud of. You know, New Orleans, Woodstock, yeah. New York. Uh, we had a world premiere at Florida Film Festival in Orlando at the Enzian Theater, which is an incredible theater. Yeah. We did Napa Valley Film Festival, a whole bunch of other ones. Let, let's, let's sit on that for a second, if you yeah. don't mind. Yeah, sure. So walk us through that. Like you, you, you find out that your film has been accepted into this festival. Mm-hmm. And are you in the room watching it or I should say watching the the reactions to it and what, what's going through your mind, um, as it's going, cause that's a lot of festivals that it ran through. Yeah. It was, it was a lot. It's almost like going on tour for a band. Yeah. So, so what was that like? Not every film festival would pay for our travel. Okay. So in the ones that did usually would only do like one or two people. So because we had a big enough crew, we didn't all go to all of them. So Mm -hmm. We all came to the world premiere in Florida, but, um, you know, like my director and one of the producers went to New York for Woodstock. And then they also went to like tall grass, uh, film festival, which I believe is in Kansas, Kansas. Sorry if it's not in Kansas. Um, but then I went to Spokane film festival in, okay. um, you know, Washington with, uh, one of our other producers, but then my wife and I, Whitney went to Napa Valley film festival together. So we kind of bounced around and, yeah. and tried to rep where we could. Um, but to answer that, the question about the reactions. Yeah. So the world premiere at Florida film festival was, um, terrifying because oh. we were very proud of this film and still yes. to this day, I'm still very proud of this film yeah. because it is what it was, what we wanted it to be, mm-hmm. whether that means it's good or bad is that's anyone else's opinion. That's sure. fine. But what we wanted it to be is what it became, Yes, which is really cool. And so that was a very big confidence booster for all of us. But watching people watch it was terrifying, especially me as an actor. I'm the lead in the movie. When people started laughing early in, I can't express the relief I felt <laughs> to, oh. to feel like no matter what, there will be moments where of, of levity and brevity and 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 uh, catharsis. Yeah. But then people started crying and people started cheering and 
we got a standing ovation wow. and it was just like, what is happening? And yeah. again, it's, you know, small, but you know, well-respected film festival. It, it, it felt like I made it. Yeah. And that was in 2012, you know, cut to 2015, mm-hmm. uh, nothing had come of it really other than all of those amazing film festival experiences, but I hadn't gotten enough. I hadn't gotten jobs. I hadn't gotten meetings. I hadn't, I didn't have an agent yet. Uh, and I was still working as an assistant on a TV show. Okay. Oh, hold on. Yeah. An assistant for like a, a big TV show or a smaller so TV show? So this was, so I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead. I had worked on House MD as the medical researcher. Oh, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Back up, back up, <laughs> yeah, back yeah. up. We're jumping See, around my time. mom loved House. So we got to oh, talk yeah. about this sure, for a second. Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. So back up for a second. Yes. The film festival, mm-hmm. you're, you're saying that in terms of like screenwriting, and getting your name out there, not much was happening, not despite much. how good it did. Yes. Before I ask you more about how you got to house and how that all started, mm-hmm. why do you think that was? I think that if we had made Dead Dad, I'd say four to eight years prior, mm. we would have hit the peak of indie filmmaking at a micro budget. Yeah. When people like the Duplass brothers, And um, a lot of other phenomenal kind of what would be considered mumblecore directors and and writers were making those movies and getting success and getting Sundance hits and slam dance and all that, all the big prestigious film festivals. But we made it in 2012 and it would that that kind of wave was over. Okay, Um, uh, it was it was well respected, but the appetite for a film like that had waned massively. Gotcha. So uh, I think that there was a lot of like, oh, yeah, this is really good. Hey, you know, I haven't seen a, a, a mumble core ish micro budget film in a long time. Hey, good. Good on you. Yeah. But nobody was going to empty their pockets for us. Whereas, you know, like cut to, you know, seven years prior with Duplass Brothers and Puffy Chair at Film Festival, you know, mm-hmm. that's that was the beginning of their career. Right. right, right. And had ours maybe been sooner, we maybe not have had the same meteoric yeah. and and well-deserved rise that the Duplass brothers did. But that was kind of our template was like the Duplass sure, brothers sure. did that movie. What if we did ours? Right. Just maybe a little too late in the wave. But even though it didn't necessarily take off that way, there is something to be said about being proud of what you made and making the thing mm-hmm. that you wanted to make. Yes. Because there are, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there are movies that get made that are not that do not turn out the way mm-hmm. that the directors and the writers wanted them to. Yeah, we could easily talk about my other feature film. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> when talking about that, but but here's the thing on that is that though the, the lessons are equally important. Yes. Um. And and that was that's my experience with all of writing is uh, you learn so much when your vision is not achieved. Wow. Wow. So no matter what, you know, the difference between your first film and your second film, there's Mm -hmm. different things that you're learning and that ultimately contributes to, you know, you being where you are now. Yeah. Equally important. Yeah. To back up a bit. Mm -hmm. So house is like a that's like a big show mm-hmm. how, how did you get there uh the simple answer is nepotism but, <laughs> but the, the, the long answer Please, is i love the transparency <laughs> the well so uh florida state film school has a very robust alumni okay. association um i was lucky that the two years before i started i started film school in 2007 i uh, graduated in 2009 up uh, for the mfa screenwriting program mm-hmm. my brother was in the production program from 2005 to 2007. Okay. While he was doing that in Tallahassee, I was getting my undergrad in creative writing and film studies in Tallahassee. Yeah. My brother is not a writer. I wrote all of his movies. Mm. So I had the experience of getting to work with people that were a year above my brother, below yeah. my brother, his class, then my class, then the people under me. Sure. Five. I had access to five years of wow. home school students. Wow. So by the time I went out to LA, th- there was a lot of people that I knew. One of my good friends, Erica Spates, was working as the medical researcher on House. Mm -hmm. How she got that job is not a surprising thing at all because she's just smart and knows how to pitch herself. Um, But uh, she knew that there was a position opening up um, as a writer's assistant on that show. Yeah. And um, she helped me get that job. It stuck her, stuck her neck out for me. Yeah. Um, within one week of me getting that job, she got staffed on a TV show 
the right the medical researcher job opened up and I got it. Wow, wow. So it was it was quick and and yes. interesting, but it was um but I had to prove my worth the whole time. And, and it was fascinating. Yeah, and so let me ask you a little more about that. How did you first decide to go to Hollywood at the particular time that you did? Mm. And how soon after you got there did this happen? So I uh, graduated in the summer of, of 09 from grad mm-hmm. school, um, did not move out to LA until the end of November mm-hmm. with my now wife. Uh, we actually proposed to her on our road trip out there. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> in, in Vegas of all romantic places. <laughs> um, but that I got that job in the, I believe it was the August or September of 2010. So okay. less than a year later, but I had to go through some grueling internships. Uh, to get there. Mm. And, and again, equal talk about equally important, a positive and negative experience of internships. Like what did you do in those internships? Was it writing or uh, one of them? I was a reader okay. for a horror film or a horror, uh, production company. And the other one, I was a production intern for a clip show. Okay. Uh, it was actually the Rotten Tomatoes show. It was oh, a, fun. Yeah. Comedy show that they had on yeah. cur- cur- the now defunct current, current TV. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that, that job was amazing. The reader job for the production company was terrible. Mm. Uh, I learned a lot um, yeah. on both of them, but, um, when those internships ended, I did not have anything. Mm. Um, and then and that's when I lucked out with, um, with my friend and the position on house. Do you think luck is a part of how everybody gets Absolutely. there in Hollywood? Absolutely. A timing, location, luck, and perseverance are crucial ingredients. And, wow. Um, more so than talent, sadly. Yeah. Um, but I also will say luckily because I'm lucky because, uh, yes, I think I was pretty talented, um, at least for where I was as yeah. a writer at that point. But I wasn't ready. But, um, but I, I was lucky enough to get a shot. Yeah. And then I had to prove myself. And that was where I learned a whole bunch was that you had to make yourself essential. Mm-hmm. And that was my job on house was to make myself essential to the writers every single day for two seasons. I did the last two seasons of the show. So, so what did that look like in terms of, you know, were you in the room with mm-hmm. the main writers of the show frequently? Were you brought in at different times? What, what did that relationship look like? The house ran pretty differently than a lot of writer rooms that that I'm familiar with now. Mm-hmm. Um, the writers didn't meet as a room all the time. It was more common that they would be in their individual corners in their own offices writing episodes or planning okay. stuff. We would come together for like season arc pitches, like maybe two or three times a year. Everybody okay. would come together. Or if somebody mm-hmm. was having difficulty with the story, we would all come together. Um, and I would take notes as the writer's mm-hmm. assistant slash medical researcher. Um, but my main job was every single day reading medical journals, coming up with interesting diseases uh, to pitch. Wow. Uh, and I had to come up with a 20 uh, story pitch at the end of every week for medical issues, big and small, all the way down to because in every episode of House, there was like a clinic story. Yeah. Uh, and then there was like a middle level story. And then there was the big medical mystery of the week. Mm-hmm. And so I needed to come up with 20 of those wow. every single week. Wow. So becoming a hypochondriac was easy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I did that for two years and it wasn't, it didn't get me as close to the flame as I wanted to be, Sure, but it was amazing experience in research Yeah, um, and story fodder uh, mm-hmm. and finding a story in everything. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Finding a story in everything. Everything. Because if somebody said like, what, like, wh- why'd you put that story in there? I'd be like, well, I was just imagining, you know, what if a little girl came in and, you know, her ear was smaller than the other ear and nobody thought anything of it. Maybe, you know, you know, there was a birth defect, who knows? And then, and that's how it starts. Exactly. And so, and then, and then I was, and then people are like, oh, that's a cool idea. I'm like, oh, cool. And they're like, okay, now, now go talk to our medical consultants and make it work for this story I'm trying to do. So wow. they'd say like, I'm trying to do this story. Can you make that disease work for this? And I'm like, sure. And then I would talk to a doctor and, and we would figure it out. And which, which studio was that again? Uh, that was Fox. That was Fox. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so, so it was on the Fox lot, but it was an NBC show. It was interesting. It was originally a Fox pilot that NBC bought. So yeah, it was, we worked on the Fox lot. Yeah. And so you're, you're in this place mm-hmm. that is known for creating stories mm-hmm. and finding a story in everything. Mm-hmm. And then I know eventually you get to Warner Brothers yeah. and now you're at Sony. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause I, I've been to Sony pictures. I've been to the studio in Culver and I've been to Warner Brothers in mm-hmm. Burbank mm-hmm. And I just like kind of geek out like while I'm there, I'm just kind of like, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe what's been created here, the talent that's here. What's that like though, 
I, I, that was me like three hours, like in each. <laughs> and I just like lost my mind. Sure. What's that like being in that? Like every day, like day in and day out, you're surrounded by these storytellers and this, these places where these worlds come to life. It's great. Uh, it's, it's inspiring. It's interesting though, because like on the other hand, it is just also your office. So like there is kind of like a naturalization that happens pretty quickly where it's yeah. like, you know, like I remember I worked, um, for on a for Conan O'Brien on a spinoff show of his that he did sadly one that was not successful. Mm -hmm. And I worked on the Warner brothers lot, um, every yeah. day. Uh, mm -hmm. and that was cause I was, an, I was obsessed with Animaniacs when I was a kid Yeah, and the Warner brothers live in the water lot. Yeah. yeah and the, the water, water tower. tower. And yeah. 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 And so that was literally driving to work every day. There was the set of Animaniacs. Yep. But you know, like you stop looking up after a while, mm. um, you know, you, then it's just like, walking through the gates these big beautiful gates you're just walking through them because it's your security check before you get to the office wow so you know like you lose a little bit of, of that luster in any of these places that you've worked because i can imagine the grind that you get mm -hmm. in when yeah. you're writing and i don't know did you ever like have a place that you would go where you would kind of rediscover or rem remember why you were there or, yes. re or rekindle that passion so what, what was that? on the fox lot the main mm -hmm. drive in there's a mural of Luke fighting Darth Vader on the Death Star. And that's driving in. And it's a, I will say, um, no judgments aside, it's not a particularly great mural. It doesn't matter. The content yeah. was impactful always. So that's interesting. Sorry, before yeah. you continue, that that's what you mentioned in your childhood yes. with Star Wars. Exactly. And it was a reminder. Wow. Of like, the place where they made this, maybe not mm -hmm. filmed it, but where it was conceived in the studio that brought this thing to life. You're there. Right. That's it. That's, that's your Luke and your Darth <laughs> hanging out up there and Palpatine's in the background and everything. Wow. The thing that made you want to do this. One of the things is you're here, you know, and, and even cooler for me was, um, the, diner on the fox lot was called moe's diner and it was basically made to look like moe's in the simpsons oh no way and and that's where i ate lunch a lot of the time so like for me sometimes if i was having a, a rough day on house because you know i didn't have windows in my office it was like a cubicle yeah. basically like a closed in fully cubicle and it was frustrating mm -hmm. a lot of the time because yeah. finding medical issues and concerns on a daily basis is uh taxing too bad you didn't know tori yeah <laughs> that, would have been, that would have been very helpful at the time but but i would take a walk i would go to moe's i would get a turkey bacon and avocado wow. you know, sandwich and look at the mural of star wars and it would remind me that like there's there are things to come been a couple of the highlights of your career at this point a dead dad was i would say the first <clears throat> big one for me okay um and the second one it has a connection to dead dad because i um i got a job as the script coordinator which is in a, a writer's assistant position it's a more mm -hmm. technical one yeah um on uh the spinoff of the vampire diaries uh the originals yes and it's and first i know season. a lot of people who were were on that show oh, back yeah. in the day. Oh yeah. I mean like it, it was great. I, I worked on every single episode of the originals from the first season to the last, every single one of them. Wow. So you got to see literally a, a show end. through from beginning to yes. end. There were only three writers. Well, three people that I know that worked on every single episode of that show. Karina Adley McKenzie, Michelle Paradise, and then me. Okay. And then of course, yeah. Julie Pleck, the creator of the show. So, okay. So walk me through that for a moment. So sure. what does it look like when you're in the writer's room with these people and you're oh, saying, man. okay, like we've got a season. Mm -hmm. How do you guys do that? Oh, man, it's my favorite. It's my favorite. I love this part. So, uh, beginning of every single season, we would come together and say, um, what do we want the season to be? Um, a lot of times the showrunner who we had, um, Michael Narducci was our showrunner in the first four seasons. He okay. kind of co-ran the show with Julie Pleck, but she was busy with Vampire Diaries. And mm -hmm. then she also had another show called Containment, 
So yeah. she had multiple shows. She was okay. very, she was busier. Mike was our day to day showrunner. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final season, Mike left and Julie um, and a guy named Jeff Lieber ended up being our day to day showrunners. Okay. But every single season you'd come together and the showrunner, whether it was Mike, Julie or Jeff would say, here are things I would want to do. Or mm -hmm. they would say, here are things that the CW and or Warner Brothers have asked us to do, um, which usually were minimal. Uh, they kind of wanted us to do our thing, but we still had to pitch our season to them before we got the green light to move in any direction. But we would say, what are things that we're all passionate about? But then we'd all go around the room and, you know, somebody would be like, my wife's pregnant. I'm thinking a lot about parenthood. I really want to lean into mm. a story about parenthood this season. I, I kind of want to talk about the difficulties in uh, a miscarriage, or I want to talk about like uh, the pain of losing a sibling. Like yeah. how can we weave that in? And, and then somebody would be like, Oh, well, you know, like, Oh, I lost my brother when I was 14. Like, what if, what if we tell a story? You know, like, so you would, you would start to get, you would get really personal. So you're, you, it's almost like therapy. It is therapy. I mean, wow. a writer's room is basically a bunch of um, really passionate people in a room getting very personal and turning that experience into story. Wow. And it is endlessly amazing. I love writer's rooms are a beautiful thing, especially healthy ones yeah. with safe space that allows you to just be as vulnerable as you need to be. Um, cause not all rooms are that way. We, sure. we were very lucky that our room was very supportive and helpful and could turn crazy things into beautiful stories. And so that's what our, our season, we would say like, so this is what we want to do. And then you'd start honing in and then we like, Oh, what are the three arcs of that season? And yeah. cause you got to break it up into, you know, whether it's 13 or 24 episodes and you know, our first uh, three seasons were 22 episodes and then our last two were 13. So like it depended yeah. on how many episodes we had. Mm -hmm. If it was 13, we knew the whole season. Yeah. If it was 22, we kind of knew the first two thirds and then we had an idea for the end, but you can't plot 22 episodes in, in two weeks. Yeah. Um, but you could roughly plot two, uh, an entire season in, in two weeks. So is it okay if we enter the writer's room and get a little vulnerable for a second? Yeah, let's go there. All right. So what's an episode you wrote for the originals? that came out of a personal experience of yours? Oh man. Um, well, it's interesting because like one of the things that I do a lot is I don't make my experience one-to-one. -one. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll transmute it to something else. Mm -hmm. um, issues that I have with um, friends or family or with myself or my own like battles with mental health or something, I'll transfer to a similar idea Okay. And, and, and you put that same energy and passion into, mm -hmm. um, there was an episode, the, my first episode that I wrote in season three with the great Christopher Hollier is an episode called beautiful mistake. It's mm -hmm. the sixth episode of the season. It was a, it was a really fascinating episode f about brothers, the, the problem of, of being fully open and vulnerable with your sibling. Mm -hmm. And then also the effects of a past lover coming crashing into your world. Okay. Um, I could relate to all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the story I wanted to tell was the issues inherent in that. And uh, the opening scene of that episode, actually the, the scene that happens after what we call the title card mm -hmm. um, is one of my favorites that I've ever, I've ever written. Wow. Still to this day, I think about it, but it's because uh, my co-writer who was much higher up on the totem pole than me, Chris Hollier really pushed me, mm. taught me a lot. It's a lot of what he taught me in that experience. I teach to my students now. Yeah. Um, and it was about digging deeper and finding other ways of saying what you're trying to say that are unexpected. Yeah. And through doing so, I was able to turn specific things from myself into specific things for other characters. Uh, and, and so that's a roundabout way of saying that that episode was, a way for me to infuse very personal story without ever anyone knowing it was about me. Yeah. So you're describing this scene mm -hmm. that's very meaningful and important to you. What's it like seeing it from mm. ink and paper to, I don't know, do you get to be on set at all? Yes. Luckily on the originals, the writers were flown to Atlanta um, and we filmed in Conyers and I got to be on set uh, for every single shot, every single day. So what, what, what's it like when you see the actors actually acting out what you wrote? It's incredible. Um, it, it's kind of one of my favorite parts is the actual getting it on its feet um, mm -hmm. because there, as anyone knows, you know, writing is rewriting. 
So you write something that you think works on mm -hmm. paper, um, and then you uh, have to make it work for production, which mm -hmm. is in and of itself its own rewrite. Um, locations might change. You know, you might have actor availability, and so you have to switch characters, stuff like that. Yeah. But then you also start hearing it coming out of the actor's mouths. Mm -hmm. And it's not always exactly what you expected. So there is actors who have opinions. Um, mm -hmm. of, of they play these characters. And then you hear it and you're like, oh, that's not what I wanted it to be. Yeah. It's incredible because you get to see this living, breathing thing that you get to nurse to to life. Yeah. And so that's what it is. It's incredible. And then you get to see the edited version of it that then gets screened with the audio design and the soundtrack and everything. And you're suddenly just like, wow, there it is. Wow. So it's really cool. And it's, it, here's the thing that's very humbling is that like very little of that is you, you shepherd it from beginning to end, Yeah, but it's a, a bunch of phenomenal craftsmen and women that make it happen. So it's, it's a, an unbelievably collaborative experience. Wow. So as you look to the future, I'll give you a chance here to do this. <laughs> What's kind of like your dream project? My dream project, I'm blessed that I'm actually currently developing it with Sony. Mm -hmm. I wrote a project. I wrote a pilot in 2016 when I was on the originals. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've been trying to write since I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And I tried to write it as a play in grad school unsuccessfully. And then I finally cracked it and wrote it in 2016. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking when I wrote it, this will be the thing I write at the end of my career. Mm -hmm. I make at the end of my career yeah. when I have enough clout. Yes. Um, I am pleased to say that it ended up being the first thing I ever sold, wow. um, which is, uh, humbling and shocking in equal measure. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's, that's the thing that I'm currently developing. We are, uh, just about to go out to buyers for, um, and that's what I'm hoping, uh, gets made in the near future. So the way this works is for us who are on mm -hmm. the outside, mm -hmm. sure. you come up with this idea mm -hmm. and you don't, do you, you sell the idea to Sony? Do you pitch the idea to Sony? I, so that's one way. One, one, one thing you can do is you can just come up with a pitch and you can, having not written it, and then you can just pitch can, it. Can, can I come up with a pitch for something? You can. Any, really? Anyone can. The can question I, is, can somebody get you in the door to can, Sony? That's listen, can anyone get me in the door for Marvel? Because I've got this really good idea for a Silver Surfer movie. I'm where, in. Where Silver Surfer like comes to Earth. Do you need and, a co-writer? <laughs> I do. I do. Yes. I got this really good idea, though. Oh, man. I want to hear uh, But it'd be like Silver Surfer would come and he would you know galactus would send him to earth and he would like have to judge if earth was worthy of being devoured yes. of yes. of sur surviving or being devoured by galactus and so what he does is he travels the world and he 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 sees all the different superheroes mm. within the marvel universe it's kind of expi inspired by alex ross's oh sure yeah, uh, yeah. the marvels mm -hmm. sure. you know mm -hmm. series that he did, but it'd be through the eyes of Silver Surfer. And so he's like seeing like the bigotry against mutants. Oof. And he's seeing like the humbleness of Spider-Man doing his thing in the Avengers. He's seeing them make mistakes and doing well, villains, heroes. It'd be this whole existential crisis of is humanity worth saving through the eyes of an outsider. Wow. And then Silver Surfer would, of course, deem that it would. But Galactus would have a different viewpoint. And you would see throughout the movie where Galactus is coming from, and then they'd have this final confrontation. So yes. I don't know. That's my pitch. That's good. You might <laughs> want to keep that on lock so they don't steal that from you. Because that is So yeah, so you come up with this dream pitch. Are you allowed to share with us on here at all yeah, what, I what can't, it is? I can't give too much information, okay. but it is so it, it's a supernatural Vietnam War pilot. You know, I made it myself. It's my own IP, my own intellectual property. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So as we're starting to kind of wrap up here, I'd like to know. You're in this job, which is a passion, mm -hmm. and you enjoy and you love what you do, but there's definitely got to be times, you know, where it's almost an act of faith. Yes. Like you're, you're writing, you're writing, and you don't know if it's going to be accepted or not. Mm -hmm. What keeps you going in those moments? What I'm, sustains you? I'm very lucky that I'm a teacher because my mm -hmm. students sustain me. Wow. Um, and more importantly than that, um, people sustain me. There are stories all around us all the time yeah. that are emotional and inspiring and I have an eye for them now. So if I find myself in a creative rut, I, I just open my eyes wide. Yeah. 
Um, and I see lots of inspiration all the way around me, especially with a lot of my students. Um, I, I, I teach at University of Delaware for undergraduates. Mm -hmm. They've never written anything before in the realm of TV. Mm -hmm. So they're writing and creating and developing pilots from nothing. Uh, and it is phenomenally inspiring to watch them find something that they suddenly are like, oh, there it is. That's cool. Wow. This character. What if? Oh, what if I did this thing with that? And like you watch them achieve that. Or yeah. I say, hey, what if what if you reconceive this moment? And they you see their eyes light up and they're like, oh, and and then I could do that thing. And I'm like, yes. You mm -hmm. see the the innate ability to tell stories that everyone has. And that's like one of the things I teach is that like you're in this class. I don't know why. I don't know if it's a prerequisite. I don't know if you're passionate about writing in a different medium or you want to be a TV writer. Yeah. doesn't matter. By the end of this class, you're going to believe you can be a writer. Wow. And that's the thing is that we all have that innate ability. It's just how do you nurture that? How do you find it? How do you inspire it? And because I've had to find that inspiration in so many things, my whole goal is to just inspire that within people. Yeah. And that's why here at All Things Narrative, we really want to connect these worlds of narrative because if we think of our lives as a story and if we think ourselves as protagonists in our story that face conflicts and problems and we are transformed mm -hmm. as we face them and we look at these stories that we love and we craft these stories and we sometimes forget to stop and ask ourselves, What's the story I'm living right now? And is the story that I find myself living in meaningful? Mm -hmm. You know, as a storyteller, you yeah. spend time in stories. Yeah. So what advice would you give to anyone seeking to live a meaningful story? Well, first off, that was very beautifully put. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Thank you. Um, I think... As the thing that's interesting about being a writer is that you can't extricate yourself from your creation ultimately. Mm. So a lot of times people think like, I'm just going to sit down and write. And it's like, that's, that's possible, but you, you kind of need to know your own mind before you can truly fully get into the mind of a character, mm -hmm. or at least you need to be curious. Mm -hmm. So I would say to anyone who's interested in living a meaningful story, the best thing you can do is be grateful for what you have. Be grateful for everything you get to experience, positive or negative. And also know that there's significantly more love and empathy in this world than a lot of media and people show us. Because what I have learned in my life is that it's easier to find love, empathy, and support than a lot of people think. Yeah. So if you are struggling, if you are confused, there is actually helping hands around more than you'd think. And uh, reaching out and asking for help and being vulnerable is one of the strongest things you can do. Yeah. And I think that you can't also extricate your life from the lives of those around you. So including people in your story mm. and, and making yourself a part of other people's story is a great way to find purpose. Amen. And that's what we're here for at All Things Narrative. And if you want to learn more about how we can empower you to live a meaningful story, it goes beyond just this podcast. You know, we offer workshops and classes for groups. We offer one-on-one -on -one, uh, personalized life coaching. We act like writers. We think like writers for our lives. And we try to better understand our experiences, make connections, and deal with the problems and conflicts that we find ourselves facing and journeying towards a more meaningful story. And so if you would like more information about that, please visit allthingsnarrative.com or you can email me personally at Derek, H-D-E-R-R-I-C-K-H, -R -R at allthingsnarrative.com. Kyle, there's a really, as, as we're wrapping up here, there's a really cool opportunity that I announced on the episode last week where I totally resonate with what you're saying here about the just the negativity in the world. And we know that we're in crazy times right now where mm -hmm. there is just a lot of hopelessness. And so we're trying to, on this podcast, create a collective document, per se, mm -hmm. where we're taking submissions right now till the middle of May, where 
you can send in uh, just 30 second voice memo of just you sharing your story right now about what sustains you, what's keeping you going through the COVID pandemic, through war raging around the world, through inflation and the economy and racism and all the garbage we're dealing with right now, you know, what values and beliefs and sense of purpose and passions and stories and what's keeping you going. And so we really want to bring all those into one space here. And so I like to invite all listeners out there, if you're hearing this and you're resonating with these ideas and you want to find a way to give back, uh, to be able to inspire other people in their stories, feel free to record that and send that into that email address, Derek H at all things narrative.com. And on Tuesday, May 31st, we are going to release this podcast just as we call it in narrative practices, a collective document as a way to honor and to celebrate the stories and maybe even the stories of unsung heroes, people like you and me around the world that are just trying to do good and bring a little bit of love and joy into these dark times we're in to be the light. So Kyle, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Loved it. Awesome. And if you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And also feel free to rate and review us so that we can continue to get this podcast out there. Feel free to also connect with us on social media through Facebook and Instagram at All Things Narrative. And if you're a film fan like we are, uh, feel free to hit me up on Letterboxd as well, which a uh, link to my profile will be in the show notes here. So you can feel free to judge me all you want on my opinions on film. And to all my listeners out there, we'll be back next week to dive more into Narrative 101, talking about people and problems and what it means to live a meaningful story. So until then, this is your friendly narrative practitioner, Derek, signing off. Thank you all and take care.